We are in the book of Revelation, the sixth chapter. And we covered the four horsemen of the apocalypse last week. What did the first horse, well, what color was the first horse? White. That's right. What did he represent? Power. Power. That is one of the things he represented. Yes, power. He was carrying a bow to represent war, or a crown, rather, to represent the power. He came conquering and to conquer. What event in history did I suggest the, the white Horse of the Apocalypse. We looked at Matthew 24, verses 6 and 7. And the first thing that Jesus said was going to happen before the destruction of Jerusalem was what? Wars and rumors of wars. So the white horse, I suggest last week, likely, in my mind, represents the Roman army, the war that Rome is bringing upon um, Israel. Uh, and white because a, they are um, ordained by God, righteous in that way, that they're fulfilling God's mission. Secondly, the second mission came out and another horse, what color was this horse? Red. Red. He carried the bow with him, so he's obviously of war as well. I suggested again from verse 7 of Matthew 24 that uh, this represented civil war. And we talked about the fact that um, all at the same time uh, Rome was experiencing civil wars, Israel was experiencing civil wars, and uh, during the same time, Rome marched on Jerusalem. So all these events are taking place at the same time. Um, and that horse had the ability to take peace from the land, right? And that they would kill one another. So uh, that seems likely to me to, to represent the civil wars that were leading up to the previous time of Israel. Now, this time of war, you have people in the cities fighting and killing. Josephus tells us that thousands of people uh, lie dead, man, woman, and children alike in the streets. Um, what follows that with the black horse? They aren't able to go out and till the ground. So what does that bring about? Famine. Famine, absolutely. Whitey was paying attention. Uh, brings about the famine, um, the, the scarcity of the land, or of, of food in different things. Um, so Josephus again tells us about um, the raids of the strong that would go through the city and they would come storming into a house and demand where you had your food hid. And if you didn't give it to them or didn't have food to give to them, they would kill you and your family, um, assuming that you were hiding it from them. Uh, so there was a great famine that came along with this. And then the fourth horse, he was pale. And this horse had a, a horseman had a name. What was his name? That's verse uh, 8. Death. Death. Yeah, it's not what you named your first child, is it? <laughs> Uh, and he has a friend traveling with him. Who's the friend he has traveling with him? Hell. Hell or Hades. Uh, bear in mind that there are three words that the King James translates hell. Uh, this one is, is Hades, the, the afterlife, the grave, right? Uh, which makes sense that these two go hand in hand. Um, and this represents a collective of the, the wars, the famine, the pestilence, the wild beast that all, all took place um, that were 
leading up into um, the judgment that's coming on Jerusalem. How about the balances that was in his hand? The balances in his hand um, was, had to do with the scarcity. And um, I believe Ezekiel 4 and 10 um, is a good reference there um, that you, they would be rationed. So the food they were able to eat, they would have a particular ration. That's all they would get because of the scarcity. And the, the value of the, the food would go through the roof. Now, one of the things, since Jerry, you asked that, and we did bring it up last week. He says, do not harm, at the end of um, 6, do not harm the oil and wine. And the thought process there is that these things still were somewhat um, plentiful because they could be grown and produced inside the city. And so they w didn't have the same level of scarcity that these other things did. So it's a great question. All right, any questions on the, the four horsemen? Okay, then let's continue with, um, oh, one point, and Kevin's not here, so I'll have to repeat this, um, but if I don't state it tonight before we get started, I'll forget it. Kevin yeah. asked the question, um, the, the ESV that I was reading from, the, the Zoa, the living creatures around the throne of God, every time a seal would open, uh, the ESV reads, come, the King James reads, come and see. And I had suggested that that refers to the, the horsemen, not John so much. Um, I looked into the discrepancy there, and I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but the King James is translated from the um, receptus textus, which simply means the received text. Um, and for a lot of time, those were the only manuscripts that, we've ha that we had. The other manuscripts that have later been found, and there's a lot more of them, um, are, are called the majority text. And most of the translations, modern translations, are from the majority text. <laughs> The only modern day translations that we have there from the Receptus Textus or the Received Text is the King James and the New King James translations. But these two different sets of scrolls come from two different areas uh, geographically. And um, the, the Received Text, the Receptus Textus manuscripts have coming see and that is not found in the other set of texts. So that's why the, the discrepancy there between the, the reading. It's not a matter of the Greek and different ways of translating. It's from different sources that they were translated. Um, I still believe that even if we're saying come and see, that we're talking to the horsemen because we see they are coming forth, the horsemen are. In fact, we're going to see even with the rest of these seals that are open, there's other things that take place, and John is not told to come and see. He's, he's in a place where he's seeing that we would watch a movie, um, and he's seeing all this take place. Does that make sense, or questions on that? I may just make a point of telling Kevin that since he asked that in private, and then if I remember to do that, Emily, I won't have to tell you about that again next week. All right, so we are ready then to open the fifth text, the, yeah, the fifth seal, um, in 9 through 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God, for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and offend your blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer under the number of their fellow servants, excuse me, until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. 
Okay, so when the fifth seal opens, is open. By the way, who's, who's opening these seals? <coughs> Jesus, the lamb. Spe in the, um, specifically the lamb, which represents Jesus. He's the only one worthy. So here he opens the fifth seal. And we see someone under the throne. What throne are we talking about? What's the throne we talked about earlier? The throne of God. Yep. So under the throne, what's there? Souls of very particular saints. Are these huh? the saints that were murdered for serving for serving God? Martyred. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. That's what this is. These are the saints that have been martyred to this point. We see that, um, um, that in verse 9, they had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. So the Jewish persecution has been going on. Um, who was the first martyr we read about? Stephen, absolutely. Absolutely. And it continues, it ramps up to the, there's a point of a lot that have been martyred. Now, Nero is adding to that, and so these are growing. The primary focus, though, is this Jewish, uh, this Jewish persecution. And so it's interesting, they cry out. And what's their, what's their desire? I think this is interesting because they're in heaven, but they still have a desire, don't they? What's their desire? They want um, to avenge their blood. Yes. How long are you going to let this go on? Right? How long are you going to let this take place? My kids say this. Normally, the two older ones about Anna. <laughs> How long are you going to let her do this? Right? But but this is it. She's tired of it. <laughs> She's tired of it. She's got me wore out. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah, they are asking God. Why are they asking that, by the way? I think because there was an expectation of God avenging. Right? It's been something that's been promised to them. And it still hasn't Vengeance, yet. correct. It, it, as we're reading it, yes. It's not happened. In fact, that's why it's relevant. The seals are that judgment that's going to come take place. And uh, so they're crying out, Lord, how long will you have let this go on? What's his answer? There's still more that has to be killed. Till the number's complete. There's more to be killed. It's a hard answer, isn't it? Hard answer. So they are giving white robes. I suggest you underline that because it's going to help us to understand what's coming um, future in just a little bit. Um, they were, begin of 11, they were get, each giving a white robe and told rest. Now this idea of rest is interesting because it's a little, it's a little stronger than just sit down and relax. It's be quiet. Um, rest or be quiet um, until the number of your fellow servants and their brothers should be complete. <coughs> Questions or comments? It's kind of an odd seal, isn't it? But I think it, it makes sense as we see what comes forth out of the last couple seals and when you keep in mind the seals that just proceeded. Okay, seal... Six. Any questions on five before we go to six? Okay, <laughs> verses 12 through 17. Would someone read that for me? The normal readers aren't here tonight. I looked when he opened the seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, 
the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and he is able to stand. Okay, thank you. Now, I'm sorry to backtrack a little bit, but if you would turn to Matthew 24, I'm going to cheat and use two Bibles on you again, um, because I want to read a couple of passages here um, on the fifth seal, and then we'll keep a marker there because we'll read from Matthew 24 for this um, sixth seal too. So once again, we're, is we're in 24 this time, we're going to consider that fifth seal where we have the souls under the... Um, under the altar. <clears throat> Verses 9 through 13. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all the nations for my name's sake. And then shall many of you be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Uh, through 13. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. You see the similarity there between the souls under the, the, um, under the throne here. And I want to come back to that because uh, it's the parallel that, that I'm using to, to come through here. Also, though, look back at 23 while we're there, verses 34 through 36. This is Jesus um, speaking. Wherefore, behold, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify. Who's he talking to, by the way, here? Jerusalem. So some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel upon the blood of Zacharias, son of Berchaeus, who ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Now, this is right as Jesus is entering is, is entering Jerusalem. He's looking at and he pronounces these curse, this curse on Jerusalem. He says, you killed and crucified the prophets. Remember, if we'd go back to the parable of the vineyard, uh, which is only a couple of chapters back, chapter 21. Matthew's really building up to this idea is he progresses through throughout the end of his book here. The, the parable of the vineyard was that the men in charge of the vineyard, when the master sent the servants back, what did they do to the servants? Killed them. They started with beating them, right? Eventually it proceeds to where they're killing even the very son, right? And, um, and then the, the, the master comes and, and deals with them appropriately. Now Jesus is looking and he's saying directly to Jerusalem, you've killed the prophets, you've scourged them, and upon this generation, I think it's interesting, verse 36, on this very generation is going to come the punishment for all that that's taken place. I think you see that same idea with those under the throne that are calling out and he's saying the number is not quite complete yet. There's a few more to be killed. Questions or comments on that? Apologize for going ahead and then coming back. So because I caused that confusion, I'm going to read 12 through 17 again. I want to emphasize it's not because Amanda didn't do a great job reading it, but it's because I got distracted there. Um, when he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, and full, the full moon came, became like blood, 
and the scar stars of the skies fell from the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and island that was removed from its place. When the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, and everyone slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks and of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Now, it's interesting here on a couple fronts. Now, while I'll start at the end and fall back, it's, it's interesting that what's causing this great calamity that people are hiding in the mountains and saying, fall in on us, is the wrath of the lamb. And we know last week that it's not just the lamb, right? It's not the normal lamb. Uh, this is Jesus, the Messiah, who has great power. Now, as we followed throughout this, we read now about this great earthquake that causes even the sun and moon to fall and the mountains to fall. And we say, well, the sun's still up in the sky, the moon's still up in the sky. Uh, obviously, this is talking about the end, the end judgment, right? Because this couldn't have happened to this place, to this point, or we would have known about it. The interesting thing is to keep in mind the symbolic language that is taking place. The earthquake, we're speeping back here, I was, I was waiting to hear worse sounds, but they didn't come, so it must be okay. <laughs> How many of you have ever been in an earthquake? I was, I was, um, the one it hit Greensburg. I was right in Greensburg when it hit. But it did a lot of damage, but it wasn't very significant. And I guess if you were sitting down, you could really feel it. Uh, but if you were standing, you didn't notice anything happen. Because it was such a small magnitude. Well, Emily Mann had me standing doing work, so I didn't get to feel the earthquake. But uh, anyone that was sitting at that time felt it. But significant earthquakes, there's nothing else in nature there that's more destabilizing, is there? It, it, it destabilizes everything. And when we read about an earthquake here, behold, when this seal was open, there was a great earthquake. Everything, what Jesus is symbolizing, everything you know is going to be destabilized. Now, the sun became black as sackcloth, and the full moon became like blood. We're going to go to a pass couple passages here that will help us understand this. But suns and stars, remember Jacob's, uh, excuse me, Joseph's um, uh, prayer, excuse me, his vision, his dream, I'm trying to say, of his father and mother and his brothers. What was it? One had to do with hay. What was the other one? They were going to bow down to him. What were they represented as? His brothers were stars. His parents were the sun and moon. Throughout all of Old Testament scripture, the sun and moon and stars, sun and moon had to deal with um, rulers, with kings and queens and the like. Stars had to do with princes or governors. Wouldn't that make sense? That we're going to have this destabilizing event that, that shakes everything we know and rulers fall out. In the years just prior to um, Jerusalem falling, the civil wars took the lives of almost all the governors. Herod was killed. Um, Nero dies um, a, a terrible death. And then there's several, um, several emperors who were killed 
by uprisings. Um, and several, both Jewish and non-Jewish, high priests, um, governors, kings in the area are all killed in these civil wars. Um, and it is a horrific time where the leaders are just following one after another. To add to that, mountains normally referred to nations. What's going to happen to the mountains here? Where is it? What, what verse? 14. The sky shall vanish like a scroll that's being rolled up, and every mountain and island shall be removed from its place. And we're going to see next week that Jesus, when he strikes the fig tree down in Matthew 21, it's widely accepted that he's talking about, he's pronouncing the curse on, on uh, Jerusalem, on Judaism. You know what he says right after that? The disciples say to him, say, uh, how did this tree just wither immediately like that? He says, you had a grain of faith, you would tell the mountain to be removed and it would be. Now, if we're thinking about physical mountains, the apostles fall far short of that, don't they? But their prayers, what we're going to see in another chapter or two, is their prayers become before God, and he takes the fiery mountain, he throws it in the sea. What we're talking about here is nations, in particular the, the Jewish nation. Okay, let's, let's look at a couple passages. Uh, if you would turn back to Matthew 24 and 29, verse chapter 24 and 29, just for our parallel's sake. <laughs> Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, and Hypocrite, you excuse me. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the mountains. Did that sound like anything from your translations? No. Now, I, it, I'll bet you chapter twenty-four will sound a lot more like it. <laughs> if you turn back one page to chapter twenty-three, you might see something similar to mine. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the, soon will, the sun will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Sounds very similar, doesn't it? Now, you say, but still sounds like the, the second coming of Jesus. This passage really is interesting to me. Turn to Joel, the second chapter. When you think of Joel 2, who do you think about quoting this verse? In what context? Yes, Peter quotes it. Amanda says in Acts, where more specifically? Day of Pentecost. Chapter 2, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and the female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit. You're all familiar with that, right? What did Peter say when he quoted that? In Acts second chapter. He's saying that's right now. Right? At the day of Pentecost. They look at Peter in context that Peter's speaking in tongues along with the other apostles and they say, these men are drunk. He says, we're not drunk. Let me tell you what this is. And he quotes Joel the second chapter, verses 28 and 29. Now, read with me just two more verses, if you would, here in Joel 2. And I will show you wonders in the heavens and on earth blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. 
And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in the Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those. You think this is the second coming? Pay attention to this pass, these words. In Jerusalem there shall be those who, what? Escape. As the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Isn't that interesting? This is the very passage that Peter quotes on the day of Pentecost and says this is what's happening. And when we come back here to Joel, we see the sun turning dark, the moon turning to blood, and that there'll be some in Jerusalem at this time who escape. And of those who escape, the Lord's going to call them His. Now, as you consider that, we'll look at one more passage in Hebrews. Isn't it interesting that the very next passage, chapter 7, is God sealing those. He says, wait, wait, don't let this happen. I'm going to seal those who are mine. And we'll talk about how he, how he does that. One last passage, Hebrews 12, 25 and through 29. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on the earth, much less will he, we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his, faith, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised. Yet once more will I shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase... Yet once more indicates the removal of things that are shaking. That is things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Here towards the end of Hebrews the Hebrew writers telling the Jews, listen, what is able to be shaken, the physical, is going to be removed. Be grateful we have a kingdom that can't be shaken. It's a spiritual kingdom. Just a few years after this, everything physical about the Jewish religion was shaken to the point that it came crumbling down. Uh, it was destabilized in this earthquake that we that we just read about questions or comments one last point at the end of verse 13 we see that the stars and the, are falling out of the sky like like fig trees that fall when what hits them a mighty wind, a mighty wind. I suggest you underline that mighty wind because it is an event that takes place. When we start into verse 4, or chapter 7, excuse me, the first verse says, After I saw the four angels, after this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth holding back what? Are you with me? The four winds. John is going to be shown that this wind that's going to knock away these rulers and these princes, are, it's going to take place, but we're going to hold it back. The angels are going to hold it back from happening until we take care of those who are gods. Questions or comments? So the fifth, sixth seal then refers to the rulers and the great destabilizing events that are going to take place. 
All these are getting at different elements of the same judgment of God coming on Jerusalem. Okay, let's look at verses 1 through 4. These are the 144,000. After this, I saw the four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on the earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the earth and sea saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Now, we've been going through, how many seals are, are there on this scroll? Seven. How many have we opened? Six. I believe that chapter 7 is an elaboration upon that sixth seal. Because we're eventually going to come back to that seventh seal. But we see when the seventh, sixth seal opens, there's this mighty wind that causes all this damage. And in chapter 7, we see four angels stopping the wind and holding it off until what happens? Do not harm anything, verse 3, until we have what? Sealed the servants. Now, how, where are we sealing them, Emily? Do you catch that? The very next phrase. On their foreheads. Now, we get another chapter or two, and people are going to become all concerned with sealing the, the servants of the beast on their foreheads. And we're going to talk about that being literal. I say that we as in the majority of people. But we forget that before that ever takes place, God's people are sealed on their foreheads. Now, do you remember, I believe in Deuteronomy 6, that they, the Jewish people were told to always teach the commandments of God and to keep it ever before their foreheads. Okay? Ever before their heads. The Pharisees take this literal and they start wearing. Yeah, phylacteries. They, they start wearing God's word on their foreheads. <clears throat> now, did they get the point? No, it wasn't in their heart. When God said keep it on your head, keep it on your mind, he didn't mean wear pictures of it. He meant know it, right? The same is true here. Um, if we are to come back, the, the sealed, what, the way the saints are sealed in this particular case is with knowledge. Here's why. The Roman army surrounds Jerusalem. And you know what the Jews thought? We've got this. We're okay. But I mentioned all the emperors dying and things. Vespasian brings the Roman army right up to uh, Rome, right up, excuse me, Jerusalem. And then he goes back because he wants to become emperor, and Titus takes over. And there's this break where the Roman army actually steps back away from Jerusalem. And do you know what all the Christians in Jerusalem do at that moment? They prayed, Emily, they did it on the run. <clears throat> they got out. Do you want to know why they got out? Because they had heard what was taught, and we'll end with this, this idea. Um, in, in Matthew 24, and verse 15 and following, Jesus, remember talking about, we can't go there for time's sake, but talking about destruction in Jerusalem, he says, when you see the abomination of desolation, well, that's difficult. Daniel talked about the same thing, right? That's difficult to understand. Luke was talking 
about in chapter 21 of Luke, he's talking the Gentiles. And when he makes the same quote of Jesus, you want to know how he says it? When you see armies surrounding, that's the abomination of desolation. Get out. Go. Josephus tells us that not a Christian was killed. Those who remained in the city died horrific deaths. I don't remember the exact number that Josephus gives us, but it's horrific and it's immense. He was a um, Jewish historian. Interesting story, um, but basically he, he was a Jewish general who made a suicide pact with his other generals as Vespasian was gathering in on them. And after they all killed themselves, he said, you know what, someone needs to tell the story. <laughs> so he went out to, Rome and, uh, to the Roman army and said, hey, can I travel with you and let me tell the story? And, and he was a historian. He told a lot of the Jewish history. These people that, he was not a Christian, by the way. Not? No. These people that, like Stephen, they won't be avenged until Judgment Day, probably. I believe they're avenged in 70 AD. I believe that's the very premise of this book, uh, of the book of Revelation. That this avenge, this is getting ready to take place. Now, their total victory won't be until the end of the time. They're already sealed. And the physical avenging takes place in 70 AD. <coughs> People who are who crucified Jesus Christ, remember he said to him in, in chapter 23, that all these things are going to fall on this generation. That generation paid the death for what they've done. We'll come back. Thank you for your time.